name is Dr. Rick Sigill. I'm and action. Hey, uh, Jay had a... This is Kirk to them. And action. Hey, everyone, it's Dr. Rick. Uh, Anthony had a question on diabetes and being a vegan. Now, he just stumbled across veganism because he has a friend who's a vegan, practicing vegan, and he thought it was interesting. So before I get into that, though, if you, this is the first time you're finding me, don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below and the alert button to find out when I do new videos. So these are both two different uh, nutrition practices. And uh, those of you who follow me know that I'm on a vegan kick at this point in time, and I do think that I'm dialed in. Took a while when I first switched over, it was tough. <clears throat> Being used to eating fat and occasional meat, fish, <clears throat> it made it hard just to switch to plant. But I've dialed this thing in. I'm aggressively working out better than before and certainly the variable of it being spring, usually I'll blossom in the spring. Sunshine brings me strength, but <clears throat> I'm on fire and I'm 56 years old and I think I have a lot more to go. So we'll push the envelope till the end of the summer and I'll show you my blood tests. But if you're a diabetic, and you're a vegan, man, that's double duty because you have to be watching and honoring the foods that you eat as far as keeping them all plant-based. Then also uh, honoring the fact that you probably have a little bit of insulin resistance. That's what diabetes is, insulin resistance. Now, <clears throat> most of my diabetics that come in to see me now are type two. So, T2D is, it used to be just very rare, but now everybody's getting it, even kids. And it didn't make, it didn't make sense before. Now it makes sense that we are just overeating. We are in a society of overabundance. And when that happens, you'll just continue eating a lots of food, any time of the day, ad libitum, uh, with no restrictions. Because nowadays you can find food that's super cheap. Uh, all the fast food, cheap. Uh, processed food, cheap. Internet food, cheap. Gas station food, cheap. But you will, it'll come at a price, and that price will come five to 20 years down the line in the form of diabetes. So that's why it's important, even before you feel anything, even before you notice your waistline is huge, to be aware of what you're eating. <clears throat> and how best to be aware? Well, we learn from our colleagues. We learn from our friends that are all injecting themselves or having to do restrictions. Now, here's the thing with diabetes. You're supposed to be restricting your food intake, but usually what I'll see is diabetics will have uh, insulin pumps because they failed injections and they couldn't get things under control. So I'll oftentimes see somebody using a pump, continuous insulin pump and jacking it up when they eat something bad, turning it down when they're exercising. So that is not the way to do it. Now, granted, there are some people who are right on with what they do and what they eat and, and how they monitor their insulin. This is, uh, just wanted to show it, this is a Freestyle Libre. It's a 24-hour continuous glucose monitor. It's pretty decent. Uh, the Dexcom G6 is probably a little more uh, flexible, accurate, and easier to use. This is pretty good. I'll be doing an uh, un unboxing soon, probably tomorrow. But <clears throat> even with that, that does not give a no holds barred, I do not have to watch my diet kind of thing. Just because you can dial in and see what your numbers are doesn't mean you just turn on the insulin. If you're, so the way we use that is you keep your food stable. And if you keep your food stable three times, two times a day, or intermittent fasting, eight hour window, whatever you decide, and no matter what kind of practice you have, you maintain that intake as best as you can over the course of 24 hours. And if your insulin spikes high, you have to dial it down. Either you increase your medicines, which is reasonable, or you play around with your nutrition. I would always say play around with nutrition first. And there's different ways to do it. You don't have to, you don't have to just cut food out so that you're drinking water. That's not going to be sustainable. You'll be bored. You'll be apprehensive. And you'll search for something as a crave because eventually you're going to be wanting something when you take away so much. I think that that's when we can manipulate macronutrients. And I love the way the millennials, the scientists, put out information about how uh, macronutrients work, about how 
uh, keto affects the brain, about how vegetarianism is powerful and reverses disease, uh, about how protein is supposed to be maximized to uh, stimulate protein synthesis and work as a satiety producing supplement uh, or macronutrient. So there's a lot of science to it, but you can kind of get lost in the weeds if you don't follow uh, the textbooks properly or regularly. So I'm going to try to break it down into a little bit of an easier uh, understanding. That's why I put this together. So I guess we'll start with uh, what is diabetes. So diabetes is something uh, I often just refer to as insulin resistance. So this is a schematic about what happens when you eat something. You're, this is the stomach, the fuel that you just ate. I like to think of it, break it down into the food is being fuel. And as I mentioned on a Facebook post, your fuel is either going to help the engine or it's going to harm the engine. So we want to make choices that help the engine. So your fuel goes down to the stomach, it gets digested in the stomach with its acids, and then it gets to the small intestine, the duodenum, mixes in with the insulin that comes from the pancreas. And when it mixes in with the insulin, you have this combination of insulin and fuel that gets into the bloodstream uh, right outside the duodenum or small intestine and you have the bloodstream the portal vein that takes blood to the liver all with combination insulin fuel together these molecules combine together and it gets into the liver the liver partitions this fuel and sends it off in the bloodstream to the rest of the body when this combination in the blood vessel of insulin fuel I slash F gets to where it has to get to at where the cell is to be utilizing this fuel, whether it's brain tissue uh, or uh, hormone tissue or gland tissue or bone tissue, your cell has a little bit of a door. That door needs a lock to open the key. So insulin in together with the fuel is supposed to open the door. It's supposed to be the key. The problem is, and when, and when you open the door, because you get the right key, the fuel gets into the cell, the cell can do what it has to do to produce ATP. Adenosine triphosphate takes care of enzymatic processes, takes care of all the functions of the mitochondria, or of the uh, enzymes of the, of the cell, and it, it specializes, depending on which cell, it specializes in doing its duties. Now the problem is, insulin resistance locks the door and changes the key. So even if you have all this fuel insulin floating around the bloodstream, it can't get, the fuel cannot get into the cell. The cell can't do what it has to do running on no fuel, no energy. So it, what does this do? The cell says, hey, pancreas, make some more insulin because we don't got any fuel. Nothing's getting in the door. When in all actuality is they just change the lock. So the cell sends a message to the brain. The brain says, pancreas, make more insulin pancreas makes more insulin thinking that there's not enough lock and key combinations so more insulin gets back to here and then makes this even more insulin resistant so the the cell protects itself from an overabundance of insulin all at once or throughout the whole day let's just take the picture of all at once so if you have this huge spike of insulin uh, because fuel's coming down it's going to have a enormous amount of insulin fuel combinations and insulin by itself, because sometimes you have the insulin by itself floating around there because it couldn't find a matchup. Well, the cell door has to really say, okay, you come in, but you stay out. You come in, you stay out. So it gets selective. When it gets selective, that's called insulin resistance. And when there's more insulin produced, then it gets even more selective. And it just gets to be a, a spiral downhill because you can't get any fuel in there. So eventually what happens is this is why I like checking not only hemoglobin A1Cs on my diabetics, but insulins in the morning to look at and find insulin resistance. I really believe that before the hemoglobin A1C, that's that blood test you do every three months, before that turns positive, you'll actually have insulin spikes in the morning. You're not supposed to have insulin spikes in the morning unless you just had a huge carbohydrate-rich breakfast or unless you're indulging with a huge carbohydrate rich dinner from the night before that's still digesting in your system. So when that happens, you're waking up in the morning with massive doses of insulin being secreted by the pancreas even when there's no fuel around or it's leftover fuel from last night. You don't need insulin all day long. You don't need insulin in the morning. In fact, I don't eat until about 12 because of the fasting I'm doing and my insulin is rock solid down. I think it was two. 
like to have insulin that's less than 10. Some of my patients will come in with 15, it's too high. I think two to seven is awesome, so uh, I would shoot for that. But you have to train your pancreas and your brain not to make so much insulin in the morning. How do you do that? Cutting out the fuel that's high carbohydrate. So the fuel sources that we eat come in either carbohydrates, fats, or proteins. I put a plus or minus here on the protein because carbohydrates cause insulin spiking. When you have any carbohydrate in the stomach or the bloodstream, the pancreas starts to create insulin, thinking that it has to put this stuff away. Because you can't have a blood, you can't have all your blood vessels full of carbohydrate, uh, glucose, and insulin. It's irritating. So what does the body do? It tries to get this stuff out of the blood vessel because the blood vessel is very delicate. Having too much of this IF combination will irritate it. So if the door to the cell is closed because this cell is insulin resistant, one way to get it, before I detract from this, is you get muscle turned on because there is no door here. Actually, there's no door, it's just an open pathway from blood vessel into muscle. So the, there is an unlimited amount of entry of insulin fuel combinations right into the muscle. You don't need a key, it's an open door. So that's like a built-in mechanism for fight or flight. If we're trying to defend or run, you want massive amounts of insulin at hand without having to worry about opening the door and closing the door and recognizing this, the combination. So if, the more muscle you have, and I don't, I don't mean just cardiovascular, um, walking muscle, hiking muscle, cycling muscle, I mean muscle, like insulin, like, like type 2A or type 2B, also known as type 2X muscle fibers. I think if you have a plethora of the three different types, so that's type 2B or 2X, there's type 2A, and then there's type 1. So if you have all those muscle fibers firing off, you've got this whole plethora of different uh, uh, muscle fibers all over the body, some big, hopefully a lot of them big, uh, some just very enduring, to pull all this like a vacuum, it pulls all the insulin fuel complexes right out of the bloodstream, and it keeps it in the muscle. You don't have to necessarily utilize it because you're exercising, but when you're exercising, it'll use it up a little bit and it'll store the rest in glycogen. The liver also stores a lot of these complexes in, as glycogen, but problem is if you just keep on feeding yourself all the time, the liver will get fatter and fatter and fatter trying to store all this stuff, and when there's no more room, what does it do? It says, time to defend myself. There's way too much crap coming in here. I'm gonna have to just send everything to the fat tissue. You know, usually when you're in a, uh, a state of calm, <clears throat> and even if there's food or no food around, when you're in a state of calm and you're happy, the, the liver can take the fuel and insulin combinations and they can say, okay, this is going to hormone. I'm gonna partition this to the brain. I'm gonna partition this to the glands. I'm gonna partition this to the testicles, the ovaries, to the babies. So <clears throat> the liver knows what to do when it's not stressed out. When you just have massive amounts all day long, eating, 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 liver's gonna say, whoa, 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 I can't take all this and I'm full of glycogen. I'm just gonna throw everything one way because this is probably fight or flight. I'm gonna throw everything into a fat cell. That's the adipose tissue in the visceral organ. Or that's not, well, it's not really an organ. It's just a visceral momentum. The fat in the viscera, in the stomach, that just sits there and creates estrogen and works as, uh, well, it gives you that pear shape. And we don't need that. That just leaks and exudes triglycerides, high LDL, estrogen. So it's just a failsafe for the liver to just put something into if you keep on feeding it stuff and it doesn't want to be fed. So... That is why the, the concept, at least that's my, how I interpret it, and that's why eating well, a vegan diabetic would, in theory, be watching this, the, the amount of food because of the diabetes, watching the calorie amount, the macronutrient amount, but also uh, making sure that the fuel is only plant-based, which makes it really arduous in trying to measure this stuff out. But, the, so the bottom line with veganism is no milk and no dairy, or no meat and no dairy. The bottom line with uh, insulin is, uh, or diabetes is insulin resistance, usually elevated triglycerides, usually a waist to hip ratio that's huge, and then hypertension. So as long as you know all that, if you fit into that, then you're probably diabetic. Some people call it metabolic syndrome, but as I was alluding to here, uh, carbohydrates, our fuel source. That's probably our yummiest fuel source because it gives us a little bit of a rush, but it also, ins it also stimulates insulin the most of all three macronutrients. 
Fat doesn't actually in, uh, stimulate insulin. Fat is a fuel source that goes right in here. It can float around the bloodstream without even binding with insulin. And the cool thing about fat is that if it's healthy fat, like the keto guys, and I think I did a, if I didn't do a video on keto, I probably will soon. But when you have the fat, uh, healthy fats, usually in the form of triglycerides, end up in a blood vessel about to go into the cell, totally different transport system. You don't need insulin to get in there, just get in there. Same thing with the muscle. It takes a little bit of a, uh, adaptation to utilize fat as your fuel source, but it can be done. That's why the keto guys always talk about this uh, initiation of, of fat, uh, being a fat adapted. It takes about supposedly eight, six to eight weeks to get the body and the system to utilize it properly. But I mean, better late than never. I like the guys who go between carbohydrate and fat. So there's some people who cycle their keto kind of adaptation. Uh, I'm not keto. That that takes a lot more. Doing this and then keto is crazy. It takes a lot of planning. I just thought that the keto practice was a little bit too much planning for me. So I have a hint of keto in the form of MCT oil and other oils, but I'm for the most part vegan and I limit my calorie sources and I'm also putting my feeding window into a certain time. So carbohydrates, high insulin response, nice fuel. Fat, no insulin response or very little insulin response, great fuel, but you have to take a little bit of adaptation to it. Protein, in some cases, depending on which protein it is, it can initiate an insulin response. There are some amino acids that are insulin uh, uh, secreting or uh, stimulating. There are some amino acids that are not are kind of neutral, but the, that's why I put a plus or minus here. So these are the three fuel sources that we get in our food, in our food and that's basically what we get when we eat, and there's other things aside from that that give you a little bit of satiety, give you a little bit of um, happiness, so it all depends on how you prepare this. And different continents all over the world have different ways to prepare this. And that's why it's thought that when you eat a whole food, maybe mostly plant-based diet, cooked from scratch, like the way grandma would do it, in your different countries, in Asia, in Europe, in India, in Germany, in uh, Italy, in Greece, in Sardinia, in Costa Rica. So when you have old school cooking, you actually will have less likelihood of major disease. I think when we process stuff, we try to break it down into the basic building blocks and repackage it into something that will be easy, fast, and freezable, and have a shelf life, which really destroys some of the good things that you're supposed to eat in your fuel sources. If we can get back to that kind of cooking, and limit it to, because usually it's just uh, breakfast in the morning cooked by grandma, breakfast in the evening cooked by grandma or mom, uh, sometimes a lunch that might be prepped by mom or dad, but, but it's still, the bottom line is we only eat what, together as a family two to three times a day. And if we can keep it to that, great, but now what do we do? We pass by food sources for eating any time of the day, any place. I mean, who would think that you'd eat at a gas station? Or in some cases, even vending machines in a subway. I mean, it's just crazy that there's so much food available and it's super cheap so that even a kid can just put some quarters in or swipe and then get, get something to eat really quick. And the fastest things that are easy to eat are usually the ones that are most dangerous, that lead to the diabetes. So if we can avoid, if you're at the verge of having diabetes, Fix it now, whether you go vegan or keto or paleo or Ornish, whatever it is you decide, stick with it, but have the intention to change the way it's digested. If you can get that muscle moving, great. If you can limit and watch your, your macronutrients, great. If you can reduce stress, watch your waistline, get some good sleep, all those things are important. But ultimately, diabetes has its challenges. Being a vegan has its challenges too. Being both, uh, a little complicated, Anthony, but uh, I, I think I embrace that. If we have to do it, then I would. Whatever works for everybody. There is no one diet that works for everybody. That's why all this stuff has to be personally prescribed. A diet, a nutrition plan, an exercise plan, a sleeping routine, all has to be, uh, taking care of deficiencies and supplements, all has to be personally prescribed. That's why I do what I do with regards to integrative medicine. I think we have to take uh, people on a case-by-case -case basis. 
The ecological fallacy is when we try to pigeonhole people into one form of eating, it doesn't work. So I, I really think that that's why it, it takes time to extract all this information. It takes time to have you come back in after the blood test. Have to see the, I have to see the response to the patient as far as how they did over three months, uh, how they'll just react when I say, I want you to be vegan. And if they just say, no way, then I would probably not go that route, not push any harder, but play around with the idea. And I embrace whatever the patient comes up with. So it's a relationship that has to be fine-tuned and nurtured and developed so we can avoid all that crap that's coming. But at the same time, if you're already deep into it, that's okay. But honor yourself as far as how we're going to beat it. Because if you wait until the decade of change, if you're 50, you're going to be 60, you wait till you're 60 because you're too busy, your metabolic rate is going to slow down big time. And if you haven't uh, fully adapted to 50s and you think you're going to carry that into your 60s when you're ready for it, I got news for you. Uh, uh, and a major life event will usually happen. And then you have two things you got to worry about. The major life event and the stuff you never took, of, took care of when you were in your 50s. Same thing in your 20s when you're turning 30s. 30s turn your 40s. Uh, one family, one a kid family to a three kid family, uh, single to spouse, so <clears throat> or or ma family to taking care of caregivers for older parents. So it all has very deep challenges, and I think it has to be sustainable. But you have to love it to be sustainable. I can't force this on anybody. Most most of the time, when I try to force with threat, the threats kind of go by the wayside after about a month. That's why I see people every three months until we get this thing rock solid, until we get dialed in. Uh, we, I'm forgiving, but I will not forgive myself if we don't beat the diseases. So, Anthony, this is going to be a little tough. We're going to try to do this best we can. We'll articulate. We'll see what happens in a couple months, and we'll reformulate this thing. For anybody else that has had a challenge with trying to control their diabetes or happens to be a vegan diabetic, please put your comments down below. We'd love to hear about how success can come to other people. Otherwise, don't forget to subscribe and hit the alert button, and I'll see you at the next clinic.